Chapter 1 The studio was filled with the rich odor of roses, and when the light summer wind stirred amidst the trees of the garden, there came through the open door the heavy scent of the lilac, or the more delicate perfume of the pink flowering thorn. From the corner of the divan of Persian saddlebags, on which he was lying, smoking, as usual, innumerable cigarettes, Lord Henry Wotton could just catch the gleam of the honey-sweet and honey-colored blossoms of the laburnum, whose tremulous branches seemed hardly able to bear the burden of a beauty so flame-like as theirs. And now and then, the fantastic shadows of birds in flight flitted across the long, two-sore silk curtains that were stretched in front of the huge window, producing a kind of momentary Japanese effect and making him think of those pallid, jade-faced painters who, in an art that is necessarily immobile, seek to convey the sense of swiftness and motion, the sullen murmur of the bees shouldering their way through the long, unmown grass, or circling with monotonous insistence round the black crocketed spires of the early June hollyhocks, seem to make the stillness more oppressive, and in the dim roar of London was like the burdened note of a distant organ. In the center of the room, clamped to an upright easel, stood the full-length portrait of a young man of extraordinary personal beauty, and in front of it, some little distance away, was sitting the artist himself, Basil Howard, whose sudden disappearance some years ago caused, at the time, such public excitement and gave rise to so many strange conjectures. As he looked at the gracious and comely figure he had so skillfully mirrored in his art, a smile of pleasure passed across his face and seemed about to linger there. But he suddenly started up and, closing his eyes, placed his fingers upon the lids as though he sought to imprison within his brain some curious dream from which he feared he might awake. It is your best work yet, Basil. The best thing you have ever done, said Lord Henry languidly. You must certainly send it next year to the Grosvenor. The Academy is too large and too vulgar. The Grosvenor is the only place. I don't think I will send it anywhere, he answered, tossing his head back in the odd way that used to make his friends laugh at him in Oxford. No, I won't send it anywhere. Lord Henry elevated his eyebrows and looked at him in amazement through the thin blue wreath of smoke that curled up in such a fanciful whirls from his heavy opium-tainted cigarette. Not send it anywhere? My dear fellow, why? Have you any reason? What odd chaps you painters are. You do anything in the world to gain reputation as soon as you have one. You seem to want to throw it away. It is silly of you. For there is only one thing in the world worse than being talked about. And that is not being talked about. A portrait like this would set you far above all the young men in England and make the old men quite jealous if old men are ever capable of any emotion. I know you will laugh at me, he replied, but I really can't exhibit it. I've put too much of myself into it. Lord Henry stretched his long legs out on the divan and shook with laughter. Yes, I knew you would laugh, but it is quite true all the same. Too much of yourself in it, upon my word, Basil, I didn't know you were so vain. And I really can't see any resemblance between you, with your rugged, strong face and your cool black hair, and this young Adonis, who looks as if he was made of ivory and rose leaves. Why, my dear Basil, he is a narcissus, and you, well, of course you have an intellectual expression and all that, but beauty... Real beauty ends where an intellectual expression begins. Intellect is in itself an exaggeration and destroys the harmony of any face. The moment one sits down to think, 
One becomes all nose or all forehead or something horrid. Look at the successful men in any of the learned professions. How perfectly hideous they are. Except, of course, in the church. But then in the church, they don't think. A bishop keeps on saying at the age of 80 what he was told to say when he was a boy of 18, and consequently, he has always looked absolutely delightful. Your mysterious young friend, whose name you have never told me, but whose picture really fascinates me, never thinks. I feel quite sure of that. He is a brainless, beautiful thing, who should be always here in winter when you have no flowers to look at. And always here at summer, when we want something to chill our intelligence. Don't flatter yourself, Basil. You are not in the least like him. You don't understand me, Harry. Of course I'm not like him. I know perfectly well, indeed. I should be sorry to look like him. You shrug your shoulders. I'm telling you the truth. There's a fatality about all physical and intellectual distinctions. A sort of fatality that seems to dog through history the faltering steps of kings. It is better not to have different from one's fellows. The ugly and the stupid have the best of it in this world. They can sit quietly and gape at the play. If they know nothing of victory, they are at least spared the knowledge of defeat, and live as we all should live, undisturbed, indifferent, and without disquiet. They never bring ruin upon others, nor ever receive it from alien hands. Your rank and wealth, Harry, my brains such as they are, my fame, whatever it may be worth, Dorian Gray's good looks. We will all suffer for what the gods have given us, suffer terribly. Dorian Gray, is that his name? said Lord Henry, walking across the studio towards Basil Howard. Yes, that is his name. I didn't intend to tell it to you. But why not? Oh, I can't explain. When I like people immensely, I never tell their names to anyone. It seems like surrendering your part of them. You know, how I love secrecy. It's the only thing that can make modern life wonderful or mysterious to me. The commonest thing is delightful if one only hides it. When I leave town, I never tell people where I'm going. If I did, I would lose all my pleasure. It is a silly habit, I dare say. But somehow it seems to bring a great deal of romance into one's life. I suppose you think me awfully foolish about it. Not at all, answered Lord Henry, laying his hand upon his shoulder. Not at all, my dear Basil. You seem to forget that I am married. And the one charm of marriage is that it makes a life of deception necessary for both parties. I never know where my wife is, and my wife never knows what I am doing. When we meet, we do meet occasionally. When we dine together or go out to the Dukes, we tell each other the most absurd stories with the most serious faces. My wife is very good at it. Much better, in fact, than I am. She never gets confused over her dates, and I always do. But when she does find me out, she makes no row of it. I sometimes wish she would, but she merely laughs at me. I hate the way you talk about your married life, Harry, said Basil Howard, shaking his head, and strolling towards the door that led to the garden. I believe that you are really a good husband, but that you are thoroughly ashamed of your own virtues. You are an extraordinary fellow. You never say a moral thing, and you never do a wrong thing. Your cynicism is simply a pose. Being natural is simply a pose, and the most irritating pose I know, cried Lord Henry, laughing. And the two young men went out into the garden together, and for a time they did not speak. After a long pause, Lord Henry pulled out his watch. I'm afraid I must be going, Basil, he murmured, and before I go, I insist on your answering a question I put to you some time ago. What is that? asked Basil Howard, keeping his eyes fixed on the ground. You know quite well. I do not, Harry. Well, I will tell you what it is. Please don't. I must. I want you to explain to me why you won't exhibit Dorian Gray's picture. I want the real reason. I told you the real reason. No, you did not. You said it was because there was too much of yourself in it. Now that 
is childish. Harry, said Basil Howard, looking at him straight in the face, every portrait that is painted with feeling is a portrait of the artist, not the sitter. The sitter is merely the accident, the occasion. It is not he who is revealed by the painter, it is rather the painter who, on the colored canvas, reveals himself. The reason I will not exhibit this picture is that I am afraid that I have shown with it, it, it the secret of my own soul. Lord Harry laughed. And what is that? he asked. I, I will tell you, said Howard. An expression of perplexity came over his face. I am all expectation, Basil, murmured his companion, looking at him. Oh, there really is very little to tell, Harry, answered the young painter. I I'm afraid you will be hardly understand it. Perhaps you will hardly believe it. Lord Henry smiled and, leaning down, plucked a pink petal daisy from the grass and examined it. I am quite sure I shall understand it, he replied, gazing intently at the little gold white feather disc, and I can believe anything, provided that it is incredible. The wind shook some blossoms from the trees, and the heavy lilac blooms with their clustering stars moved to and fro in the languid air. A grasshopper began to chirrup in the grass. A long, thin dragonfly floated by on its brown gauze wings. Lord Henry felt as if he could hear Basil Howard's heart beating, and he wondered what was coming. Well, this is incredible, repeated Howard rather bitterly. Incredible to me at times. I don't know what it means. The story is simply this. Two months ago, I went to a crush at Lady Brandon's. You know... We poor painters have to show ourselves in society from time to time just to remind the public that we are not savages. With an evening coat and a white tie, as you told me once, anybody, even a stoke broker, can gain a reputation for being civilized. Well, after I'd been in the room about ten minutes talking to this huge overdressed dowagers and tedious academicians, I suddenly became conscious that someone was looking at me. I turned halfway around and saw Dorian Gray for the first time. When our eyes met, I felt that I was growing pale. A curious instinct of terror came over me. I knew that I had come face to face with someone whose mere personality was so fascinating that if I was allowed to do so, it would absorb my whole nature, my whole soul, my very art itself. I did not want any external influence in my life. You know yourself, Harry, how independent I am by nature. My father destined me for the army. I insisted on going to Oxford. Then he made me enter my name at the Middle Temple before I had eaten half a dozen dinners. I gave up the bar and announced my intention of becoming a painter. I have always been my own master, had at least always been so till I met Dorian Gray, but then, I, I don't know how to explain it to you, something seemed to tell me that I was on the verge of a terrible crisis in my life. I had a strange feeling that fate had in store for me exquisite joys and exquisite sorrows. I knew that if I spoke to Dorian, I would become absolutely devoted to him, and that I ought not to speak with him. I grew afraid and turned to quit the room. I was not conscious that it made me do so. It was cowardice. I take no credit to myself for trying to escape. Conscience and cowardice are really the same things, Basil. Conscience is the trade name of the firm. That is all. I don't believe that, Harry. However... Whatever was my motive, and it may have been pride, for I used to be very proud. I s certainly struggled to the door. There, of course, I stumbled against Lady Brandon. You are not going to run away so soon, Mr. Howard, she screamed out. You know her shrill and horrid voice. Yes, she is a peacock in everything but beauty, said Lord Henry, pulling the daisy to bits with his long, nervous fingers. I could not get rid of her. She brought me up to the royalties and... People with stars and garters and elderly ladies with gigantic tiaras and hooked noses. She spoke of me to her dearest friend. I had only met her once before, but she took it into her head to lionize me. I believe some picture of mine had made a great success at the time, at least had been chattered about at the penny newspapers, which in the 19th century standard of immortality. Suddenly I found myself face to face with the young man whose personality had so strangely stirred me. We were quite close, almost touching, our eyes met again. It was mad of me, but I asked Lady Brandon to introduce me to him. Perhaps it was not so mad after all. It, it was simply inevitable. 
We would have spoken to each other without any introduction. I am sure of that. Dorian told me afterwards. He too felt we were destined to know each other. And how did Lady Brandon describe this wonderful young man? I know she goes in for giving a rapid pressy of all her guests. I remember her bringing me up to a most truculent and red-faced old gentleman covered all over with orders and ribbons and hissing into my ear in a tragic whisper. I must have been perfectly audible to everybody in the room. Something like, Sir Humpty Dumpty, you know, Afghan frontier, Russian intrigues, very successful man, wife killed by an elephant, quite inconsolable, wants to marry a beautiful American widow, everybody does nowadays, hates Mr. Gladstone, but very much interested in Beatles. Ask him what he thinks of the Shuvalov. I simply fled. I'd like to find out people for myself, but poor Lady Brandon treats her guests exactly as an auctioneer treats his goods. She either explains them entirely away, or tells one everything about them, except what one wants to know. But what did she say about Mr. Dorian Gray? Oh, she murmured, Charming boys, poor dear mother, and I, uh, quite inseparable, engaged to be married to the same... I mean, married on the same day. How how very silly of me. Quite forget what she does. He, afraid he doesn't do anything. Oh, yes. Plays the piano, or is the violin, dear Mr. Gray. We could neither of us help laughing, and we became friends at once. Laughter is not a bad beginning for a friendship, and it's the best ending for one, said Lord Henry, plucking another daisy. Howard buried his face in his hand. You don't understand what friendship is, Harry, he murmured, or... What enmity is, for that matter, you like everyone. That is to say, you are indifferent to everyone. How horribly unjust of you, cried Lord Harry, tilting his hat back and looking up at the little clouds that were drifting across the hollow turquoise of the summer sky, like raveled skines of glossy white silk. Yes, horribly unjust of you. I make a great difference between people. I choose my friends for their good looks, my acquaintances for their characters and my enemies for their brains. A man can't be too careful in the choice of his enemies. I have not got one who is a fool. They are all men of some intellectual power, and consequently, they all appreciate me. Is that vain of me? I think it's rather vain. I, I should think it was, Harry, but according to your category, I must merely be an acquaintance. My dear old Basil, you are much more than an acquaintance. And much less of a friend, I a sort of brother, I suppose? Oh, brothers. I don't care for brothers. My elder brother won't die, and my younger brothers never seem to do anything else. Harry! My dear fellow, I am not quite serious, but I can't help detesting my relations. I suppose it comes from the fact that we can't stand other people having the same faults as ourselves. I quite sympathize with the rage of the English democracy against what they call the vices of the upper classes. They feel that drunkenness, stupidity, and immorality should be their own special property, and that if any one of us makes an ass of himself, he is poaching on their preserves. When poor Southwark got into the divorce court, their indignation was quite magnificent. And yet I don't suppose that 10% of the lower orders live correctly. I don't agree with a single word you have said. And what more, Harry, I don't believe that you do either. Lord Henry stroked his pointed brown beard and tapped the toe of his patent leather boot with a tasseled malacca cane. How English you are, Basil. If one puts forward an idea to a real Englishman... Always a rash thing to do. He never dreams of considering whether the idea is right or wrong. The only thing he considers of any importance is whether one believes it oneself. Now the value of an idea has nothing whatsoever to do with the sincerity of the man who expresses it. Indeed, the probabilities are that the more insincere the man is, the more purely intellectual will the idea be. As in the case, it will not be colored by either his wants, his desires, or his prejudices. However, I don't propose to discuss politics, sociology, or metaphysics with you. I like persons better than principles. 
Tell me more about Dorian Gray. How often do you see him? Every day. I couldn't be happier if I didn't see him every day. Of course, sometimes it's only for a few minutes, but a few minutes with somebody one worships means a great deal. But you don't really worship him. I do. How extraordinary. I thought you would never care for anything but your paintings, your art. I should say, art sounds better, doesn't it? He is all my art to me now, I sometimes think, Harry, that there are only two eras of any importance in the history of the world. The first is the appearance of a new medium for art, and the second is the appearance of a new personality for art also. What the invention of oil painting was to the Venetians, the face of the Antinous was to late Greek sculpture, and the face of Dorian Gray will be someday to me. It is not merely that I paint from him, I draw from him, model from him, of course I have done all that. He has stood as Paris in dainty armor and as Adonis with a huntsman cloak and his polished boar spear. Crowned with heavy lotus blossoms, he has sat on the prow of Adrian's barge looking into the green, turbid Nile. He has leaned over the still pool of some Greek woodland and has seen the water's silent silver of the wonder of his own beauty. But he is much more than that to me. I won't tell you that I am dissatisfied with what I have done of him, or that his beauty is such that art cannot express it. There is nothing that art cannot express, and I know that the work I have done since I met Dorian Gray is good work. It is the best work of my life, but in some curious way I wonder will you understand me? His personality has suggested to me an entirely new manner in art, an entirely new mode of style. I see things differently. I think them differently. I can now recreate life in a way that was hidden from me before. A dream of form in days of thought. Who is it that says that? I forget, but it is what Dorian Gray has bet to me. The mere visible presence of this lad, for he seems to me little more than a lad, though he's really over twenty. His merely visible presence. Ah, oh, I wonder, can you realize all that that means? Unconsciously, he defines for me the lines of a fresh school. A school that it have in itself all the passion of the romantic spirit, all the perfection of the spirit that is Greek, the harmony of soul and body. How much is that? We live our madness, have separated the two, and have invented a realism that is bestial and ideality that is void. Harry, Harry, if only you knew what Dorian Gray is to me. You remember that landscape of mine, for which Agnew offered me such a huge price, but which I would not part with. It is one of the best things I have ever done, and why is it so? Because while well, I was painting it, Dorian Gray sat beside me. Basil, this is quite wonderful. I must meet Dorian Gray. Howard got up from his seat and walked up and down the garden. After some time he came back. You don't understand, Harry, he said. Dorian Gray is merely to me a motive in art. He is never more present in my work than when no image of him is there. He is simply a suggestion as I have said, of a new manner, I see in him curves of certain lines and the loveliness of the subtleties of certain colors, that is all. But then, why won't you exhibit his portrait? Because I've put into it all the extraordinary romance of which, of course, I've never dared to speak to him, and he knows nothing about it. He will never know anything about it, but the world might guess it, and I will not bear my soul to their shallow, prying eyes. My heart shall never be put under their microscope. There's too much of myself in that thing, Harry. Too much of myself. Poets are not so scrupulous as you. They know how useful passion is for their publication. Nowadays, a broken heart will run to many editions. I hate them for it. An artist should create beautiful things, but should put nothing of his own life into them. We live in an age where men treat art as if it were meant to be a form of autobiography. We have lost the abstract sense of beauty. If I live, I will show the world what it is, and for that reason the world shall never see my portrait of Dorian Gray. I think you are wrong, Basil, but I won't argue with you. It is only the intellectually lost who ever argue. Tell me, is Dorian Gray very fond of you? Howard considered for a few moments. He likes me, he answered after a pause. I, I know he likes me, of course, I flatter him dreadfully. I find his strange pleasure in saying things to him that I, I know she'll be sorry for having said. I give myself away. As a rule, he is charming to me, and we walk home together from the club arm in arm, or sit in the studio and talk of a thousand things. 
Now and then, however, he is horribly thoughtless. He seems to take a real delight in giving me pain. Then I feel, Harry, that I have given away my whole soul to one who treats as if it were a flower to put in his coat, a bit of decoration to charm his vanity, an ornament for a summer's day. Days in summer, Basil, are apt to linger. Perhaps you will tire sooner than he will. It is a sad thing to think of, but there is no doubt that genius lasts longer than beauty. That account for the fact that we will all take such pains to over-educate ourselves. In the wild struggle for existence, we want to have something that endures. And so we fill our minds with rubbish and facts in the hope of keeping our place. A thoroughly well-informed man, that is the modern ideal. And the mind of the thoroughly well-informed man is a dreadful thing. It is like a bric-a-brac shop, all monsters and dust and everything priced well above its proper value. I think you will tire first all the same. Someday you will look at Grey and he will seem to you to be a little out of drawing, or you won't like his tone of color or something. You will bitterly reproach him in your own heart and seriously think that he has behaved very badly to you. The next time he calls, you will be perfectly cold and indifferent. It will be a great pity, or it will alter you. The worst of having romance is that it leaves one so unromantic. Harry, don't talk like that. As long as I live, the personality of Dorian Gray will dominate me. Now feel what I feel. You change too often. Oh, my dear Basil, that is exactly why I can feel it. Those who are faithful know only the pleasures of love. It is the faithless who know love's tragedies. And Lord Henry struck a light on the dainty silver case and began to smoke a cigarette with a self-conscious and self-satisfied air, as if he had summed up life in a phrase. There was a rustle, a chirping of sparrows in the ivy. The blue cloud shadows chased themselves across the grass like swallows. How pleasant it is in the garden, and how delightful other people's emotions were. Much more delightful than their ideas, it seemed to him. One's own soul and the passions of one's friends, those were the fascinating things in life. He thought with pleasure of the tedious luncheon that he had missed by staying so long with Basil Howard. He had gone to his aunt's, he would have been sure to meet Lord Goodbody there and the whole conversation would have been about the housing of the poor and the necessity for model lodging houses. It was charming to escape all that. As he thought of his aunt, an idea seemed to strike him. He turned to Howard and said, My dear fellow, I've just remembered. Remembered what, Harry? Where I have heard the name Dorian Gray. Where was it? asked Howard with a slight frown. Don't look so angry, Basil. It was at my aunt, Lady Agatha's. She told me she had discovered a wonderful young man who was going to help her in the East End and that his name was Dorian Gray. I am bound to state that she never told me he was good-looking. Women have no appreciation of good looks. At least, good women have not. He said he was very earnest and had a beautiful nature. I at once pictured to him myself a creature with spectacles and lank hair, horribly freckled and tramping about on huge feet. I wish I had known it was your friend. I'm very glad you didn't, Harry. Why? I don't want you to meet him. Mr. Dorian Gray is in the studio, sir, said the butler, coming into the garden. You must introduce me now, cried Lord Henry, laughing. Basil Howard turned towards the servant, who stood blinking in the sunlight. Ask Mr. Gray to wait, Parker. I will be in in a few moments. The man bowed and went up the walk. Then he looked at Lord Henry. Dorian Gray is my dearest friend, he said. He has a simple and a beautiful nature. Your aunt was quite right in what she said of him. Don't spoil him for me. Don't try to influence him. Your influence would be bad. The world is wide and has many marvelous people in it. Don't take away from me the one person that makes life absolutely lovely to me, and that gives my art whatever wonder or charm it possesses. Mind, Harry, 
I trust you. He spoke very slowly, and the words seemed wrung out of him almost against his will. What nonsense you talk, said Lord Henry, smiling and taking Hallward by the arm. He almost led him into the house. And that is the end of chapter one. Thank you, my dear listeners, for being my audience today. Take care for now. See you next time.